everybody, my name is Rachel and welcome to my weekly wrap up of August 16th, 2015, wherein I tell you about all the great things or not so great things that I read this past week, because this was a really hit or miss reading week with some confusing things and some things that also enraged me a little bit, so you, you want to know about that, right? Let's get on with the books. The first thing that I read this week was Cinder by Marissa Meyer, the first book in the Lunar Chronicles, and I actually had so much rant about why I didn't enjoy this book and what I thought was wrong with it that I'm putting that in a separate video for you guys. So if you love this book or this series and you don't want to hear something bad about it, then maybe don't watch that. The short version is I didn't enjoy the story, I thought the world building and some of the plot devices were sloppy and not very well done, not believable, and I don't plan on reading any more of the series. Unfortunately, I hate saying that, but it's just not for me. The next book that I finished was Prodigies by Angelica Gorodischer. I pre-ordered this back in February, I think, when I read Trafalgar, which I did a review of. I, I really like Gorodischer, and I don't know how to pronounce her last name, so I hope that's the right way. It's about a the the women, mostly women, and a couple of men who live in a boarding house in a German town in the 1800s. In the first half of the story, a Japanese businesswoman named Madame Nashiro shows up, and her her entrance has this like ripple effect on the people who live there. It kind of disrupts their their inner monologues and their placid lives, and they all kind of react in various ways to this woman showing up, and they're reacting to each other as well. And then she leaves, and the rest of the book is kind of punctuated by some tragedies, some accidents, and then people getting on with their lives. I don't really know what to say about this. The more I think about it, the more I talk about it, the more I like it, and I see what's so interesting about it, but it was a bit difficult to read. It's very much literary fiction, and the only other book I have read that I think is written in any similar type of style is Mrs. Dalloway. I wouldn't say that this is like stream of consciousness, but it has that sense of just shifting slowly from mind to mind to mind, from inner monologue to inner monologue. And sometimes you don't really know when the transition has taken place. So you were in one person's head and then all of a sudden you're in somebody else's head, but you don't know which person until like three pages later when their name is finally mentioned. And it all kind of works. They're, like I said, it's not really a stream of consciousness. It's just more of these extremely long sentences of lists, this, these phrases and clauses and objects and things piling up on top of each other and there'll be this little nugget in the middle of a, a, of a sentence in the middle of a list where you're like that's an unusual thing to put right there it all has meaning but it's a cumulative effect and i don't think it's going to be for everybody this was really pushing the extent of what i'm comfortable reading just writing style wise but I thought the characters were quite interesting and there are actually some moments of like creepy almost sinister thoughts especially with some of the guys in the story like um palud i was like what was up with that dude man he was creepy he's got these little toys that he's obsessed with and he's like constantly thinking about one of the maids and ugh. anyway this is not my favorite book by gora disher but it's growing on me a lot and i think i'd like to reread it or flip through it again to see if I understand things a little bit more and that increases my enjoyment of it. So it was difficult to read, but it's, it, like I said, it's growing on me. The next thing that I finished was The Unreal and The Real, Volume 1, Where on Earth, which is selected short stories of Ursula K. Le Guin. And so this first volume are, is literary fiction, mainstream stories pulled from various collections from the 1970s to the 1990s. and I thought that they were good, but they didn't particularly appeal to me. Most of them didn't particularly appeal to me. I'm glad I read them though. Like, I'm I'm more excited to get to the second volume, which is like the SFF and the more speculative fantasy science fiction type of stuff. Um, there are 18 stories in this, and I really only liked four of them, and I'll tell you which ones. The first four stories, there's this block at the beginning, are Orsinian stories. Orsinia is a fictional Central European country that Le Guin invented and was writing stories about in the 70s up through the 1990, I think she said. And I thought that block of stories, the first four stories in this, were really good. I thought it was just a really 
a strong chunk of stories. Two of my favorites are from that. The very first story, Brothers and Sisters, which is... It's about two brothers, one of whom is badly injured in a rock quarry incident. He saved the life of a deaf man and he was injured instead. And then the deaf man's daughter shows up and this, this man, Costant, um, gets to know her as he's recovering and his brother is kind of pissy about it. But it, it was nice. It was kind of like about growing up in love and family, I guess. I really liked it. I liked the way it was written. The other Orsini and Taylor I really liked, which was Imaginary Countries, which I don't know why I like this one because it's literally about a family packing up at the end of summer and leaving their summer house. Like, I felt like that, like that could have been the opening chapter to a novel and I would want to read that novel. It, I, I would really like to read it. Um, I also really enjoyed Buffalo Gals, Won't You Come Out Tonight, which is one of her more famous stories. It is kind of Native American inspired. A young girl... Um, has an accident. She's kind of like stranded in the desert and she ends up in like the country where the Native American gods or mythical figures are and she meets Coyote, but she can't stay there. You know, she doesn't belong there. She has to go back to like the human world at some point. And I liked it. I usually am not, I don't find a lot of Native American uh, myths and folklore to be all that interesting, which is something I need to probably work on <laughs> because I don't know that much about it. But I really liked it. It was kind of heartbreaking. And the other one I liked was a very short one. It's like two or three pages called Tex. Tex? Yeah, that's hard to say. The idea of the story really appealed to me. This woman is starting to see words and everything um, in the natural world as well, and she can read it. And she's just walking along a beach, and the foam that the waves are bringing up on the beach are spelling these words but it's in another language and she can't speak it so she memorizes it and and there's no explanation like she doesn't know why this is she doesn't know why it's happening more and more frequently and then there's this big question mark at, you know in the story and it's not answered but I really like the idea of it so it was pretty good as a collection overall but it really only had a couple of standouts for me so I gave it four stars because I think it's really well written but the particular subject matter didn't appeal to me as much as her speculative fiction work has in the past. The final book that I read this week was Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier, and I wanted to know so badly what the answer was to the, the big question, the big mystery in this, that I, I read the last two-thirds of this book yesterday in a big rush. I didn't want to put it down. I wanted to know so I could talk about it today. Um, it's about a very young woman, she's like 21, and she marries a much older man, he's like twice her age. They meet randomly in Monte Carlo, they have kind of a whirlwind, non-romantic romance, get married, and then he takes her back to his house called Manderley, where she slowly becomes more and more obsessed or aware of the ghost of his previous wife, Rebecca. She's, she died in an accident, but it's like she's not really gone. On everything about this woman. She's left this imprint on people's lives and the house and you can't escape her. And it's, it's not good. It's kind of sinister feeling. And you don't really know like what's going on. What, what happened to this woman and what's going on with the new wife. She doesn't have a name, so I don't know what to call her, but the narrator, it's like, is it in her head or is there something really going on? I'm a little bit conflicted about this book because I really like the story. I read it like a mystery novel and it was very enjoyable to read it that way and I, I really wanted to know the answer to the mystery. I just flew through it. But I didn't like the characters and I didn't like their the marriage at the heart of the book, which is between Max de Winter and the unnamed narrator. I did because first of all, I didn't like Maxim. I didn't like Max at all. I thought he was kind of sexist and misogynistic and he treats his wife like she is a little child. Like he literally calls her a little girl and he's kind of dismissive and just ignores all the warning signs that she is upset or lost or doesn't know what to do. I just thought he was kind of rude about the whole thing. Like it's all about him and he was not super nice to her. And the main character, she grew on me a lot more throughout the course of the book, but I still felt that she was kind of timid. 
Which, you know, I understand because she's very young, but also she's so compliant with other people. She barely has anything to say. She never voices her own opinions or her own wishes or anything. She never puts her own stamp on this life that she is living. And I thought that was not really fun to read about. I think a lot of it is that she's she's submitting to what she thinks is going to make her husband happy without actually knowing that it's making him happy. She doesn't want to rock the boat at all, but she's making herself incredibly miserable. She's sacrificing her own happiness on a day-to-day -day basis for her husband to not upset her husband. And I was like, why? You're going to be so miserable. It's not enough to just be in love with a dude if you are so unhappy for the rest of your life because of what's going on. So I'm conflicted, but I really enjoyed reading the book. So maybe like four stars. Those are all the longer things that I read this week. I also read two short stories. I read them with Otavio from the Galilean Library because I think it's helpful to read short stories with somebody else to talk to them about them. So we read Woman at an Exhibition by E. Lily Yu and Cat Call by Delilah S. Dawson. They're both from the most recent issue of Uncanny Magazine and they're available for free online so I'll link them down below. There are also interviews with the, both of the authors that I think go really well with reading the story so we'll link them down below as well. Um, Woman at an Exhibition by Yu is about a young woman who uh, it's kind of like kicked out of her apartment by her boyfriend so he can practice his music and and she walks down to this exhibition of Edward Hopper's paintings and then she eats one of his paintings and then like the the director of the exhibit or the museum shows her the non-existent paintings of Edward Hopper's wife Josephine which in a way it's like the ghost of Josephine Hopper telling this young woman about not giving up on her art, or rather choosing a partner in her life who will not overshadow her own art, her own, what she wants to do with her life. Because, I mean, the point is that so many women in history who have had amazing talents have been left out or ignored or their work has been destroyed or forgotten, and they are overshadowed by the more famous men in their life. like. Many, many people know Edward Hopper, his very famous American painting called Nighthawks. But how many people even know that his wife existed and that she was also an artist and that her work was like lost or deliberately destroyed? And I like the message about this a lot. For such a short story that ends rather abruptly, it just really uses, it won't, it won't leave my mind. I just keep thinking about the story, so I highly recommend this one. Cat Call by Dalila S. Dawson, I didn't like so much. It's about a, another young woman, a teenager, who has continually been sexually harassed and so on by men. And one day she discovers that she can kill men by touching them. And so whenever somebody, a, a man, does something to her that's offensive or sexual harassment, she kills him or she maims him. And then this goes wrong, but she keeps doing it anyway. It's kind of, it's, I think it's very much about the, the immense level of sexual harassment that women have to live with and not being able to do anything about it. It's about the violent fantasies that people, not just women, I think that people in general think about these things, they're revenge fantasies. What would you do if you could? What is the extreme thing you would do to stop something happening to you, to get out of a situation? It makes you feel a little bit better to think about something, but you usually wouldn't do it. But this young woman actually does it and keeps doing it, and she's kind of happy about it. And it was kind of disturbing on that level. What bothered me the most about this was that it's not effective in the long run. She's not making the world a better place in any way. She's not making her life better. She's just killing people because they're dead. They have no, they, they don't know what's going to happen to them. They ha there's no link between their actions and the punishment. But is it really punishment because they can't reform? They get no chance to realize they've done something wrong. I wasn't quite sure what I thought should be taken away from the story other than it's violent and women have to live with this kind of thing. At least it was interesting. It was an interesting week of reading, I can say that. 
and looking forward to this coming week. I don't know how much reading I will get done. I don't know how much I will get done on booktube either. It's going to be kind of busy for me and I can't wait until the whole month of August is over. I want to get back to a more normal routine and some of the hectic stuff die down. So can't wait for September. That is it for me this week. Hope you guys are having a great weekend, that you have a good week, and I'll talk to you guys again in my next video. Bye.